morning, buenos dias. Um, every time, there we go, that's me. Um, every time I come to Latin America for the last couple of years, I always say this, next time uh, I will deliver my presentation in Spanish. And then every time I come back, I'm not ready to deliver my presentation in Spanish. So I apologize. I need to watch more telenovelas. Maybe next time around, uh, it will be in Espanol. Uh, so I appreciate the warm welcome. And, and thanks to all the, the committee members uh, who uh, picked this presentation and invited me down. I think it's an important topic uh, for those folks that are thinking about deploying IPv6 uh, in the enterprise space. As I go through the presentation, there will be a lot of information related to DHCP v6, and some of it is going to be a little more technical. Some of it will be just sort of more general. I'll try to contextualize it in a more general way so that if you're thinking about how DHCP v6 potentially impacts your organization, you should have a better sense after this presentation of what, where some of the, the areas to be careful are related to DHCP v6. Uh, before I Get started, though, please. Uh, we have a table set up. My colleagues Ivan Sanchez and Alejandra Aguilar are here uh, to answer any questions that you have about Infoblox and DDI technology in general or in particular. I know we do have some Infoblox customers that are here, and uh, we'd, we'd like, like to, uh, to visit with you as well. Um, so some of this you've already seen in Latif's presentation. The IPv6 statistics that I'll focus on are, are really on, centered on the U.S., uh, and I noticed that I have a, a different number than Latif had for, uh, I think, the total amount of internet penetration that we see in the U.S. I think uh, his number was around 86 percent. For some reason, I think I had a lower penetration. I don't know where I got the number. I have to go back and look, but 70 percent was the number that I used. And so as a result, we have a different um, number of IPv6 users in the U.S. Uh, I think his slide had 86, I'm sorry, um, 70 million, and I, I only show 57 million, so that's due to that difference in internet penetration. In any case, I think we can agree that, that it's, you know, north of 50 million IPv6 users in the U.S. I'll defer to Latif. I, it's probably closer to uh, the 70 million IPv6 uh, users that he showed. So that's a tremendous amount of internet penetration, and obviously, as Latif mentioned, uh, there, there are multiple factors for this, but the, the primary one is the, the involvement of, you know, the government very early in the process and putting in place mandates that uh, vendors had to follow and, and really getting IPv6 mainstreamed into, into the vendor channels earlier than later. Uh, and then, of course, the U.S. government mandates related to making sure that the federal agencies in the U.S. had some measure of IPv, measurable IPv6 adoption early. Um, so that's, a, that's given us a tremendous advantage, and that's filtered out into the, the, uh, the commercial world as well. And really the, what's driving that level of, of IPv6 uh, traffic that you see here, 25 percent of all the traffic hitting Google in the U.S. is over IPv6. Um, it, it has to do with the, the operators that have moved forward with IPv6 in the U.S. aggressively, and very much based on uh, the recognition of the expense of attempting to prolong the life of IPv4. And that's, that's really the theme that's, that's critically important, I think, when we start talking about uh, IPv6 and where we're at today and where we're trying to get to. Uh, you know, we've had a, a long history of prolonging the life of IPv4 uh, using technologies like NAT and using technologies like DHCP. And part of the challenges that we'll see related to DHCP have everything to do with how successful uh, those strategies of preserving IPv4 have been. Um, but in any case, the, the service providers in the U.S. recognizing that from a commercial standpoint, it's not affordable for them to continue to try to use IPv4 and continue to scale millions of subscribers onto their networks. Uh, so IPv6 was really the only path forward for them, and that's represented in the numbers that you see here. And, and the most astonishing one is the 70 percent of of all of Verizon's traffic is over IPv6 today, um, and that number continues to, to creep up, as you can see from the graph. I was happy to hear Azael mention the, uh, and, and Latif both mentioned the, uh, the possibility that IPv4 will be moved to historic status. Um, this, of course, is, is a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, um, uh, almost like a, I don't want to say a publicity stunt, that sounds a little too uh, harsh, but the idea here is that it, it's sort of a wake-up call to 
uh, to the industry from the IETF uh, the idea that, and if you, and if you read this, this draft, it, it's very stripped down. It just basically uh, argues that, you know, IPv6 is the new protocol, IPv4 is the, the historic protocol, and it, and it sounds almost a bit uh, uh, hyperbolic, I guess, is the word I was looking for. Um, but the reality is uh, that, that we're going to quickly see, based on levels of adoption in, in certain parts of the world, we're, we're going to move quickly to the moment where IPv4 actually is the legacy protocol on the internet, where we see more than 50% of the traffic on the internet over IPv6. And so at that point then, uh, it's entirely fair to, to argue that IPv4 is historic as far as the internet is concerned. And when that is likely to happen, um, there are different estimates, but Cisco's predictions are sometime around 2018. So less than two years away, we're likely to see that, that watershed moment when IPv6 becomes the dominant protocol on the internet, and IPv4 then is, is truly the legacy protocol. So what this means for service providers, as I've mentioned, based on the adoption levels that we see in the US, it's pretty clear. They've gotten the message uh, around the world. I think there's a recognition that the, the economies of scale that service providers are desperately reliant on uh, based on the commoditization of most of the services that they offer, based on the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the whole model, business model of just basically trying to scale up the network um, and not have any way of differentiating services across the network, uh, to keep the costs low, to keep, you know, obviously costs continue to go up for service providers based on the equipment that they need to, to use to, to add new users to their to their services. Um, IPv6 is really the only path forward for them, and so that's, you know, that's why we see those, those numbers of adoption uh, related to service providers. On the enterprise side, and that's where I'm primarily focused because the biggest part of Infoblox's business today is, is enterprise networks, uh, there's less of a compelling reason uh, as far as enterprises are concerned, IT management, CIOs at enterprises are concerned, there's less of a compelling reason and a, and a compelling drive to move to IPv6 from their perspective. And the reason for this, again, has to do with those technologies that, that went into place to extend the life of IPv4. And the first of those is NAT, of course, which Latif mentioned in, in, in detail. Network address translation, uh, something that initially was very much a boon to the smaller enterprise networks that were only operating leaf nodes, uh, you know, had basically just a stub node connected to the internet, didn't have any need for public addressing, uh, were able to continue to use NAT and uh, private addressing internally. And as a result of that, that initial uh, advantage that NAT provided, there was an operational practice that became very entrenched, where enterprises became very comfortable with NAT as a technology and then they started to imagine funny things that, that NAT did, that NAT actually doesn't do, but that they assume that it did because of the way in which NAT is often bundled with firewall, with stateful packet inspection. So you start to get this idea that, well, I've got this network and it's, it, I've got a perimeter. You know, and the whole idea of a perimeter being secure, of course, is being greatly challenged in this day of, of malware. Um, but I've got this perimeter, I've got stateful packet inspection, and I've got NAT. Nobody knows what the inside of my network looks like as far as the addresses go, uh, but there's a, there's a sort of a bit of magical thinking that goes on there based on the idea that because my address topology is obscured internally, there's an extra layer of security that I'm getting. And the reality is, as any security expert, internet security expert worth their salt will tell you, that's that's not the case. So the conflation of stateful packet inspection and NAT is one of the big challenges, I think, for enterprise network administrators to sort of think through. And I think they're starting to get the message. They're, they're, they're definitely going to have to be aware of it as we move into an IPv6 world where end-to-end -end connectivity is, is really where we're trying to get to, to unlock the value of the data that's tied up in devices that the Internet of, of Things promises, to be able to effectively manage work workloads and workspaces that are deployed into cloud technology. Um, these things are going to require a, a, a more restored model of end-to-end -end connectivity in order to be ef effectively managed and to not have a, a mishmash of gateways and complicated policies that are negotiating connectivity from one point to the next, points A through Z, to access resources. Um, so along with that comes the, you know, setting NAT aside for enterprises and the challenge there, the, the other IPv4 
uh, band-aid that was put into place very early on and, and created a, an operational practice that uh, has become very entrenched in enterprises is DHCP. So when DHCP uh, was standardized for IPv6, the idea was that we would take uh, some of what's good about auto addressing and IPv6 and the ways in which uh, IPv6 auto addressing um, contains some, some technical advantages and we would, uh, we would combine that with some of the ways in which uh, we need to operate DHCP in the way that it's classically operated in an enterprise environment. But this, as, as is typical with the, the tension between the IETF, the standards bodies, uh, and, and commerce, and with uh, you know, commercial operators of the equipment, people who are actually buying the vendor's equipment and deploying it, uh, where these standards are, are in the protocols, uh, something always sort of gets left out. There's always a sort of confusion or a challenge around what the requirements are, how, how are enterprises using DHCP, and how would they be best served by having DHCP designed um, as, as they deployed in the network with IPv6. And so there's a sort of misconception that, that uh, especially with enterprises, early, early on in their adoption efforts, that DHCP v6 is just DHCP v4 or IPv4 DHCP with IPv6 addresses. But when we get under the hood and look at what DHCP v6 is actually doing, uh, it's, it's significantly more complex and as a result some of the operational practices won't translate. So it's taken me a long time to get to the statement of the thesis for my presentation today, but that's basically it. That when you're, when you're looking at how to deploy DHCP v6 operationally, uh, you can't simply assume that you're just taking DHCP v4 and adding some IPv6 addresses to it and you're off to the races. There are very significant operational challenges created by how different DHCP v6 is. So I'll step through some of those and I'll try to keep that part of it brief so that we can get to the, the actual operational challenges themselves. So if you're not familiar with it, um, one of the, uh, the primary advantages, one of the, the actual significant improvements in DHCP v6 is the leveraging of multicast uh, to discover DHCP v6 servers and to negotiate the transaction between the server and the client to provide a DHCP v6 address. So when we had DHCP v4, it was relying on broadcast. Um, obviously, broadcast is not efficient. Uh, it creates uh, challenges in terms of segmenting networks, et cetera. Uh, v6 does away with this. DHCP v6 does away with this with, with reliance on multicast. So that's a big benefit. Um, the other major difference between DHCP, IPv4 DHCP and DHCP v6 is the fact that you, you're used to getting a, a, an IPv4 gateway from the DHCP server in, in IPv4 DHCP. So if I bring a host online in, in, in IPv4 DHCP land, it communicates with the server, gets an address, it also gets a default gateway. Um, this is also potentially less than optimal. However, having said that, many enterprises are relying on that behavior today and they're, they're assuming that they'll be able to do the same thing with DHCP v6. Uh, but the, the, the way v DHCP v6 operates is that with the router advertisement that's going out on any LAN segment from the router that's providing information about how auto addressing should be uh, performed on that link, and we'll see a slide on this in a moment, uh, that router advertisement is also responsible for telling the node where the gateway is and what the gateway is and, and its preference. So that's a, that's a key difference. Another key difference, and, I, and I'm happy uh, that Latif's presentation had a mention of CLNP because I was afraid I'd be the only one to mention it today, is the idea of the DHCP unique identifier. So in IPv4 DHCP, we are used to using the MAC address to do um, reservations for a node. Uh, in IPv6 and DHCP v6, the idea was we'll move away from that and we'll, we'll have something called the DHCP unique identifier, which as you'll, as you'll recognize is, is an acronym of an acronym. So the DH, DHCP unique identifier, uh, the do it as it's sometimes called, um, it's actually used instead of the MAC address to, ad to identify clients and servers, but, but the key difference is that it's used per node. So rather than having a MAC address, which is associated with an interface, I have a DUID that's, that's for that particular node that could have many interfaces, and each of those interfaces uh, could have one or more IPv6 addresses. So I have one unique DUID per client and one unique DUID per server. 
And already we're going to confront an operational issue in an environment where I'm cloning a lot of nodes, where I'm using uh, uh, imaging to, to spit out an, a bunch of nodes, whether they're workstations or servers or what have you. Uh, I actually have to, if, I'm, if I have a provisioning method in place to allow me to do that efficiently, uh, I, ha I actually have to, to do some steps to make sure that I get a different DUID uh, because as the DUID uh, works, it's set at, the, at boot time on the host and it's persistent across reboots. So I need to make sure that whatever the node is, that it has absolutely a unique DUID or I won't be able to use it in a DHCPv6 environment. So then if I'm not tracking um, nodes and interfaces based on MAC addresses, then I have to have some other construct to be able to do that, and that's the identity association. And this is used by DHCPv6 to identify a group of uh, assigned IPv6 addresses. So you'll notice that the interface concept is still sort of vague here. Client interfaces have m multiple IPv6 addresses, and uh, back home in the U.S., I, had a, I have a Verizon uh, LTE USB modem, and I was online the other day, and I noticed that Verizon had provisioned me uh, eight separate IPv6 addresses, uh, all global in scope. Um, and obviously, this is not something that we're used to in the IPv4 world, where typically we have one address per interface. So the I identity association then allows us to group these IPv6 addresses together, uh, one identity association per interface, and those can be um, for temporary addresses or non-temporary, and basically the difference is temporary address would be uh, recycled on a regular basis for security reasons, say, like a privacy address uh, where I want to have a node that, that's not traceable over time. Uh, in enterprise environments, this isn't desirable for obvious reasons. Um, I want to know where nodes are. I want to know where the IP addresses are configured, whether they're IPv4 or IPv6, and I want to be able to track those nodes down in the case of security issues. So non-temporary addresses are generally not something that we see uh, utilized in enterprise. So then once we uh, resign ourselves to having to, to deal with both IPv4 DHCP and DHCPv6 in the enterprise space, uh, we have to sort of look at, at the difference between a couple of different flavors of DHCPv6 and decide which one makes the most sense. Uh, so stateful versus stateless DHCPv6 is basically um, the difference between getting your IPv6 address from a DHCPv server, a DHCPv6 server, and getting your IPv6 address from a router advertisement, having your IP, rather having your node self-configure uh, a global unicast address on, on itself using information provided in the router advertisement. So <clears throat> in either case, you, you need to still have router advertisements being sent out on the link that you're using DHCPv6 on. So you never get away from that in, in the IPv6 operational environment. And, and again, there are benefits to that in that, you know, if I'm getting the default gateway from the router advertisement, that's a little bit of resiliency that I didn't necessarily have with, uh, with DHCPv4. Um, but I do have to make this choice about whether or not I want to be able to get the IPv6 address from the DHCPv6 server, and most enterprises want, and that's stateful DHCPv6, and most enterprises opt for that, that mode. Though, as we'll see, because of inconsistent behavior from the client nodes, uh, it's not always possible to do stateful DHCPv6. So if I get my address via Slack and using DHCPv6, well, then what am I getting from DHCPv6? I'm actually getting the information about uh, DNS servers, uh, domain search lists, uh, that sort of thing. But in both cases, as, as is the critical point, um, the default gateway is provided by RA, by the router advertisement. So DHCPv6 in action, here's a, just sort of a brief step through of what it looks like. Uh, you basically have a host or a node on the LAN segment, and it has a valid link local address. So this happens regardless of whether I'm running um, DHCPv6 or whether I, I'm actually trying to get an address via Slack, whatever else happens, if I have IPv6 enabled on the node, it's going to go ahead and configure itself a link local address, and then it's going to use the uh, duplicate address detection to make sure that that link local address is, is unique and valid and, and it can use that. So then it uses that as the basis for its communication with the DHCPv6 server. And this is unique to, uh, to DHCPv6, right, because in the v4 world, we had to rely on layer two. Uh, we did the layer two broadcast, and in v6, in DHCPv6, everything is at layer three. So again, uh, there's some isolation here, there's less layer confusion, and that does provide some operational benefits, uh, but also challenges, as we'll see. So the link local address typically derived from its MAC address, uh, the EUI64 construct that we see in IPv6 addresses. 
And that's, there's an example showing the addresses. I've got my Ethernet MAC, my link local IPv6 address. And so the host sends a DHCPv6 solicit to the multicast all DHCPv6 ad servers address from its link local source. A listening DHCPv6 server responds with a unicast DHCPv6 advertisement that's addressed to the link local address of the soliciting client. So now we're, we, we went from multicast um, back to unicast as the server sends the, uh, the advertisement to the, to the node. And then host a unicast a DHCPv6 request to the server. And again, this is unicasted, so much more efficient. And finally, the DHCPv6 server responds with a unicast reply, and that contains the IPv6 address and any additional network configuration options. <clears throat> so there is a way that there's actually, um, there's the information. Uh, global unicast address is the goal, right? So we've got the link local address already, but that's only link local scope, so I can only use it on that, that local LAN link. Um, now I've got a global, global unicast scope address that I can use to actually connect out to the IPv6 internet. And one other point I think that's worth mentioning is that um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, there, there's another point, I'm sure I'll think of it later, or maybe it just wasn't that important. So we also have something in IPv6, uh, in DHCPv6 called prefix delegation. And so as you begin to try to scale DHCPv6, uh, it's, it's very likely that you'll um, have an environment where you'll have devices that are downstream from each other and you don't want to have to relay DHCP v6 requests uh, from one local segment to a DHCP v6 server that's, say, far away, or you may have a situation where you have inter intermediate devices that are capable of, of allocating IPv6 space. And so DHCP v6 prefix delegation allows you to do this. From a DHCP v6 server, you can get an allocation uh, allocated, say, to, in this case, an ISP CMTS uh, or a DSLAM in, in the case of DSL. And then from there, uh, that, that CMTS can go ahead and, and prefix delegate uh, a smaller prefix out of that block that then gets used by an end user in the form of, of a v6 address. So this is, this is an example where I go from having a, a slash 56 that's allocated from the server, um, which gives me uh, 256 possible slash 64s to allocate um, to a cable modem or router. Uh, maybe that's enough, you know, if I'm doing in the architecture for a service provider uh, access layer with the CMTS, I'd probably use a larger allocation. And the reason for that is that those home users, uh, you know, they might be happy with a slash 64 today just to get online via IPv6, but in the future, the home network is actually going to be containing a number of subordinate networks that, that may have the requirement of being secured from each other. Uh, in any case, the idea of having a, a larger allocation to the CMTS and then having that allocation be <clears throat> handed down to the home network and allow me to, to say, um, issue an entire uh, slash 60 to um, a home network and give myself 16 slash 64s to configure within the home network. So there are obviously issues around how, how are you going to route uh, addresses within that, that environment. Um, that's something that HomeNet is working on in the IETF. It's not a question that's totally sorted out yet. But again, one, one thing you'll note, you should notice here is that we're not really concerned about uh, the number of addresses that we're using. Uh, you know, if I'm, go if I'm going, ha going ahead and assigning a, a slash 60 to a home, or that could be a slash 56, you know, that's uh, 256 uh, slash 64s or 16 slash 64s, depending on which one. Each one of those slash 64s has 1.8 times 10 to the 19th addresses. So I'm not, I'm not so concerned about host address conservation in that environment. But prefix delegation is something that, that if I'm a service provider, uh, you know, I've got, I've got good robust support from, from the major vendors uh, to provide this functionality. And uh, Comcast is actually responsible for, for pioneering and driving through a lot of that, that progress and success with uh, prefix delegation. <clears throat> so where, will we, where do we use DHCPv6? Basically, corporate LAN environments, obviously, have been talking a lot about enterprise networks um, and their reliance on DHCP today. They want to be able to use DHCPv6 uh, with IPv6, and that's giving them additional administrative control. Uh, wh where I'm using Slack, I don't have any way to track state of 
addresses that have been allocated using Slack, other than logging into the router and looking at the neighbor discovery cache, scraping the neighbor discovery cache, and then doing something with that information uh, to make it digestible for security purposes or uh, management purposes. You could argue wherever DHCP v4 is deployed today, although, again, because of the technical requirements that are a little bit different, um, that may not work in all cases. Certainly where prefix delegation is needed, you're only going to be to get prefix delegation out of DHCP v6. I think there have been some uh, efforts to maybe include some kind of prefix delegation uh, in, in the auto addressing components of IPv6 without having to use DHCP v6, but I don't think they've ever really gotten off the ground. And then stateless DHCP v6 might be used where clients do not support stateful DHCP v6. Um, and we'll see an example of this. Something that's complicating the landscape for enterprises as they're attempting to use uh, DHCP v6 is the fact that nodes and clients aren't all supporting DHCP v6 in the same way. So we use basically some different flag settings on the router that are set on the router advertisement that has IPv6 configured to determine whether or not uh, we'll be using st uh, Slack, state stateless address auto configuration, or whether we'll, we'll be using some flavor of DHCP v6, whether it's stateful or stateless. Um, and basically these flag settings that are set on the router advertisements are supposed to inform the node or the client uh, which of the, state, uh, the uh, auto addressing modes that it's going to use. If, uh, if you're using Slack, it's just basically the A flag. If you're using stateless, it's the A flag and the O flag. Um, A stands for autonomous, O for other, and then stateful is just the managed flag set. The O flag is supposed to be ignored. The M flag is for managed. And you can see here the resulting IPv6 address is configured as a result of having any of these flags set. At least that's the theory of how things are supposed to work. Um, but you get some strange behavior. <clears throat> You, you may encounter these situations where, and there's, there's been a lot of research done on this lately, and clients, client nodes that are running various up-to-date operating systems like Windows and OS X and the various flavors of Linux workstation, and then all of your mobile devices as well, iOS and Android, uh, you see some, some variance in terms of the behavior. Um, and I'll, I, I'm not going to go through all these, but say for uh, a situation where the host has not acquired any addresses and it sees an RA with an M flag not set and the O flag set to one. Uh, some popular OSs acquire other info from DHCP v6 addresses. Others will do so only if the A flag is also set. Well, I may not want the A flag set because I may not want to generate a Slack address on that interface. I only want the DHCP v6 address. But based on the client behavior, now I have to deal with a scenario where the client isn't behaving in the way that the standard has specified. A, a classic example of this is the scenario where I don't have any of the flags set in the router advertisement. So I don't have the A flag set, which says I don't want a Slack address, and I don't have the M flag set, which says that I don't want a stateful DHCP v6 address, and I don't have the O flag set, which says I don't want stateless DHCP v6 information from the server. OSX does the right thing and doesn't configure an address. Or arguably, that's the wrong thing to do. Maybe you want a node that basically does what it needs to do to get an address regardless of what the conditions are on the link in terms of what it sees from, from the router advertisement. Well, Windows 7, 8, and 10 all do that. So they may not see any of the flag set, but they go ahead and, and do a Hail Mary and send a DHCP v6 solicit to try to get an address regardless. And so you can actually have, that's assuming of course that there's a DHCP v6 server on the link. Because again, we've decoupled DHCP v6 uh, communication from the actual router advertisement that's telling us whether or not to use DHCP v6. So this is something that if you're operating an enterprise network environment, uh, you know, you have to expect some, some variance in terms of how the nodes and the OSs that are running on the nodes are behaving. And this can literally change from release to release because there's been tremendous progress in stabilizing the IPv6 function uh, and functionality within these various OSs. Uh, they're much more ready for prime time as far as IPv6 is concerned than they were even five years ago. But you may run into a scenario where, you know, code gets upgraded, where your operating system gets upgraded, and then you see completely different behavior uh, than you saw f for the last uh, release based on DHCP v6 flag settings and what addresses you actually end up getting. Another area where DHCP v6 is going to be challenging for enterprises, and I know this working for InfoBlox because we have a, a, a proprietary DHCP v4 failover 
uh, protocol that allows us to track state between um, highly available uh, DHCP servers so that if one DHCP server goes away, I basically got all the state tracked for those sessions on another DHCP server and I can pick up right where, um, right where I left off based on that other server going down. There is not a proprietary um, deployment of DHCP v6 failover at this point. There's no standard, um, there's no standardization for DHCP v6 failover. So you'll hear different stories about whether or not it's necessary. The, the, the classic argument is that if I'm not doing prefix delegation, I don't really need to worry about failover because I don't need to track state for um, <coughs> the actual subnets that I'm deploying as opposed to individual host leases. But a lot of enterprises, as we've, we found out at Infoblox, they, they do it today in, D, in V4, they use DHCP v failover, and they want to be able to do the same thing in IPv6. So we've seen recently a new draft that has the failover protocol defined, which suggests that uh, we should actually see a standard around supporting um, DHCP v6 failover in a way that will allow for um, the stateful tracking of leases in the same way that we do it in IPv4 today. What you can do in the meantime is this, this split prefix workaround, which is <clears throat> I have a couple of clients on the, the LAN segment here. I have a couple of DHCP v6 servers. I configure one with one half of a slash 64 prefix and I set the, the, uh, the DHCP server preference to 255, uh, which is basically saying, you know, use that server. I, I set server two with the other half of the slash 64 and I set the preference to zero. So over time, what happens is, you know, if, if the server, one of the servers goes down, I'll basically, um, I'll, I'll basically still be able to, to allocate leases to, to new clients that are coming online. <clears throat> and I, could, I can do this indefinitely for as many servers as I need to have. But over time, what happens is you get an une uneven distribution of leases in the database across the servers, and that has to be reconciled at some point. So when server two, having gone offline, when it comes back online, then I still have to figure out how my leases are varying across the two servers. There are other workarounds in, uh, in this RFC, DHCP v6 redundancy considerations. But again, if you're an enterprise and you're using failover today in DHCP v4, uh, you, you don't have it yet in DHCP v6. Another challenge is uh, first hop security. So because we've got so many more moving parts in DHCP v6 than we had in DHCP v4, because we're, uh, we're at layer three and we're using multicast and we're relying on router advertisements, uh, there's, there's the issue of security. And there have been various efforts to, to sort of address this um, by figuring out how to do things like neighbor discovery in a secure fashion. Uh, these are challenges that are, uh, they remain because of the difficulty of, of you know, distributing keys and, and dealing with the, the PKI challenges, especially in an enterprise environment. Um, so in the meantime, there are some, some sort of kludges, I guess, for lack of a better word, the same sort of thing that we've seen in IPv4 for, for improving security on a LAN segment um, for IPv4 uh, where DHCP is running or not. Uh, we, we have some of those features in DHCP v6 provided by vendors like Cisco. Uh, DHCP v6 guard is one example of it. They have others. They have uh, <clears throat> DHCP snooping. They have uh, IPv6 guard, RA guard. Uh, but the basic idea is that it's, it's quite simple. I mean, if, if you have a node that's connected to a switch and you know that that's a client node, you, you shouldn't be seeing DHCP v6 advertisements coming through that port. So in this case, if I have a target that's sending out a DHCP v6 solicit uh, to the all nodes um, DHCP v6 servers address, it's going to get a response back from the DHCP v6 server, but I could have another uh, node that's plugged in and that can also send uh, a DHCP v6 advertisement and depending on the preference that's set, in this case I have, uh, you know, maybe if, 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 I'm, if I haven't really thought about my DHCP v6 con, uh, configuration, I might have the default set, which is zero, which means that if I see a rogue DHCP v6 advertisement with 255, my host is going to go ahead and use that address. With uh, IPv6 first top security enabled DHCP v6 guard in particular, I know that uh, if I see an advertisement from uh, a port that's configured for a node or a client that I'm just going to go ahead and drop that packet and so the, the, the target never sees it and gets a valid DHCP v6 address. 
So address planning, uh, I, I focus a lot on address planning, IPv6 address planning in particular. Um, the rules of address planning don't generally change where DHCPv6 is concerned. Um, we're still, you know, whether you're using DHCPv6 or Slack, we're still thinking in terms of, you know, start with a slash 48 per site and then a slash 64 per VLAN. We're not subnetting to the right of the slash 64. So that doesn't really change whether or not I'm using Slack or DHCPv6. How the 48 is carved up within the site depends on the, topo the topological complexity of that site or the lack of it. And that's really uh, something that every organization sort of has to work through in their planning to define what their sites are that are going to each get a slash 48 and then carving up that site based on what the topology looks like internally. And one final thing, there is no DHCPv6 for Android. Um, Android developers have been very adamant in saying that they're not going to support it. So they're relying on uh, Slack and uh, basically getting uh, DNS information from the router advertisement. Recently, a, a DHCPv6 client was released for Android, so you can actually make it work, but the bad news is that that, does, that doesn't really scale in an enterprise network environment, especially where people are bringing in their Android phones from home. You can't uh, root all those devices and, and make sure that the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Android client for DHCPv6 is going to work in all cases. Finally, uh, Infoblox is focused on um, providing DNS, DHCP, and IP address management solutions, and Part of the reason I came on board five years ago was that they've been IPv6 focused uh, for, for quite a long time. So there's, there's general feature functional parity with the things that you're doing today with DNS, DHCP, and IP address management and before uh, to be able to do those in IPv6 as well. Uh, and if you want more information on the solution, definitely talk to uh, either Yvonne or Alejandro at our table outside. And then finally, I've, I've got a, a book on IPv6 address planning. If you're getting started with um, deploying IPv6, one of the first things that you're going to need to do is to put together an address plan that makes sense based on the scale of IPv6. Uh, IPv4 address planning techniques don't really work in IPv6, and so the book is really written as an effort to, to make that a simpler process and make sure that you don't have to redo your, your IPv6 address plan several times like, like I did um, back at Limelight. Um, and with that, I think that's, that's all I had on, on DHCPv6 operational challenges, and I hope uh, that it was interesting, and hopefully there'll be some questions. And feel free to, uh, to ask me one-on-one -on -one if, if there's something that you, you want to know more about in the presentation. So thank you very much.